Hey, welcome in Fellowship family and friends to another amazing gathering together here at the Fellowship Church. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. I just absolutely love that verse. Well, today is National Made in America Day, and it's a day to celebrate and support companies and brands that are manufactured right here in the good old U.S. of A. And by the way, I was made right here in the USA, and I showed up on this date 55 years ago today. So happy Made in America Day. Well, hey, grab your Bible or open up the Bible app, maybe a way to take some notes, and let's learn from God's Word. This is a passage, I'm telling you, I've wrestled with it. A lot of time and emotion and study put into this. So let's clear our calculator, remove any distractions, and let's focus our attention on the Word of God and be present right here in the moment. So we'll be in the New Testament letter called Colossians chapter 2. Let's get started. Well, let's start by, let me ask you this question. Do you feel like, or maybe you've sensed that religion seems to be getting crazier? Maybe I'll use the word a little wackier these days. For example, I was just Googling what are some of the um, kind of the craziest religions out there. I didn't even know some of these existed. For example, there's a religious movement that is followed uh, by thousands of Star Wars fans from all over the world. It's called Jediism or the Jedi Church. Yep, it really exists. I know it sounds kind of crazy, but it is a new religion that incorporates the, the fictional teaching of the Jedi, believing that the Force is actually very real, this power in the universe. They've got over 175,000 followers. Wacky, right? Or how about this one? There's a, uh, there's a small sect of Muslims and Hindus in India that actually practice throwing a child between the age of one and two off of a 50-foot-high uh, platform. They throw the child. There's a group of men down at the bottom with a sheet to catch the child, and they just believe that by going through this ritual that that is going to help this child to be smarter and healthier and live a luckier life. I mean, kind of a wacky religious practice, right? I mean, I hope you agree with me. Or how about this one? How about the Maradonian Church? Maybe you've heard of this. It's been created after the famous Argentine soccer player, Diego Maradona. Uh, and the church simply believes that he was the greatest soccer player in history. And so they pray to this fact and part of their commandments, they have this commandments established, you can Google it, check it out for yourself, is uh, that you're going to name your, uh, your child, your firstborn son, Diego. And if you're a part of this particular religious group, you're going to change your name, at least your middle name, to Diego. They have over 80,000 followers in 60 different countries. Wacky, right? I mean, that's just how I feel about it. I hope that word expresses how I feel. There's lots of those out there. In fact, it is estimated that there are over 10,000 religions in the world. You heard me, 10,000 different religions in the world. Now, I, I jotted down what are the largest ones. Christianity holds uh, kind of the premier 31% of world religion. Islam, that's the Muslims, 24%. The non-religious, that would include agnostics and atheists at 15%. Hindus, at about 15%, Buddhism, about 5%. Essentially, religion, if I kind of boiled it down, religion is mankind's attempt to reach God, whereas the Bible portrays a God who has reached down to mankind. So you see, that's really the difference between religion and having a relationship with Him. Well, about 2,000 years ago, uh, when Christianity began to spread, it was new, newly being formed in the Roman Empire. Uh, churches are being planted, planted and scattered everywhere. And one of those churches was in a city called Colossae. 
And so Colossae was situated on a, a, a very main route that would kind of get travelers from the east and from the west. And what would happen is because people are pouring in from all over the world in the exchange of goods and trades and services, it also brought philosophies and it brought religions and ideologies, as you can imagine. And, and it all kind of collected right there in Colossae. And so it kind of developed as this amalgamation of what scholars call a Colossi or Colossian heresy. And I've been talking about this for the last several weeks, kind of this mixture, if you will, of Greek philosophy and mysticism coupled with um, Jewish tradition and legalism, uh, even some Roman polytheism. All of that combined in with various cults and gods and goddesses to create a problem. And so chapter 1 and chapter 2, Paul is writing a letter on behalf of his friend Epaphras, who is like the church planter in Colossae, to address all the people that have infiltrated the young, impressionable church and created some real problems, some dysfunction in the church over false teaching. And uh, they just didn't believe that Jesus really was God, that he was like a sub-God. They, they didn't practice things like he was a deity. And as we've seen last week and even into today, they uh, began to talk about other things that you would add to salvation, like circumcision and baptism. And today he talks about things like what you can eat, what you can't eat, uh, the festivals or the days that you worship. And that's really the paragraph that we're going to be looking at today here in chapter 2. We're going to start in verse number 16 of Colossians chapter 2. And Paul is going to warn us really against three different religious practices taking place legalism, mysticism, and asceticism. And so we're going to look at those. I'm going to explain them as we go. I have a ton poured into my study on this and uh, looking forward to uh, sharing them with you. Uh, I wish I probably had broken this up into two different weeks, but we're going to try to work our way through it all in this week. So here we go. Colossians chapter 2, starting in verse 16 to the end of the chapter. Let's read it all. Then let's go back and process. So uh, I'm reading this from the ESV. It's a word-for-word -word translation. Uh, here, here it is. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are all a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism. We're going to talk about that. And worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head, from which the whole body nourished and knit together, through its joints and ligaments, grow with a growth that is from God. Verse 20, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of this world, or of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an, an appearance of wisdom, in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Now again, there's a ton in this paragraph, a lot for us to unpack. So let's start with legalism. Now, uh, it's apparent in these first couple of verses that Paul is thinking about external practices. He mentions food, and drink, and festivals, and new moons, and Sabbaths. And so all of these external activities and celebrations. So let me just say it this way. Legalism is essentially the religion of human achievement. And I think you'll kind of see that here in this passage. It's religion that says, um, it's a religion that says, legalism does, that I can earn my way to God. I can, uh, I, I can kind of do a works-based salvation, if, if you will. Now, let me just say right here, very briefly, if you boil down all religions in this world, it's really going to come down to two different approaches to God. There's going to be the works-based 
uh, let's call it human accomplishment, works-based, to get to God, or it's going to be a divine accomplishment. It's based on grace, what Jesus has done. So uh, it's either going to be, you're going to ascribe to a works-based salvation, a works-based relationship with God, or it's going to be, which is human accomplishment, or it's going to be based on what Jesus has done, a divine accomplishment. And Paul says, let's address this. We need to deal with this because it's infiltrated the early church and it's going to be a problem long term. He might have been thinking, man, think 21 centuries ahead from now. What is the church going to look like if we allow some of this to happen? And so he addresses these works-based theology. Now, earlier, and we've talked about this uh, earlier in our talks, Paul addressed two other rituals. He talked about circumcision and he talked about baptism. I've already talked about that. Now he mentions, let's just label it diets and days. He talks about these two things. So let me talk about the diets first. Now, evidently, uh, what he's addressing here, because Paul would have been an Old Testament scholar, and so we don't know exactly, but we can take a fairly educated guess here, that he is talking about people going back and keeping the Old Testament law, dietary laws. Now, you can read these in their entirety. I don't have time today. You can read them in their entirety in Leviticus chapter 11. We'll give you a great summary of the dietary laws, things like don't eat bacon, don't eat ham, no scallops, no crab. I know some of you don't like to hear that. No lobster. I'm a lobster fan. No bats. I don't know about you, but I, I don't need a law to tell me I, don't, I can't eat a bat. But no bats, no badgers, no camels, no lizards, no rats. The list goes on and on. So again, Leviticus chapter 11. And can I just say, there are some things in there I just don't, it, it doesn't matter. You don't even have to list them in Leviticus 11. I'm just not going to eat it. Uh, but there's nothing in the New Testament that tells Christian believers what they should or should not eat. Now, that may come as a surprise to you as you're watching today. There are no dietary uh, regulations. Now, your doctor may have some regulations for you. He may say, hey, this is not good for you, or this is good for you, and I would encourage you to follow some of those. But for spiritual reasons, uh, we just don't have those in the New Testament determining the do's and don'ts of what we should eat or not eat. In fact, Jesus said, and by the way, there's multiple references. I'm only giving one. Jesus said in Mark chapter 7, I went verse by verse through Mark, and I remembered this verse immediately. Chapter 7 said, All of you, listen and try to understand. It's not what goes into your body that defiles you. You're defiled by what comes from your heart. So in other words, can you just imagine a Jewish audience hearing Jesus the Messiah in Mark chapter 7, when Jesus was living, saying this to them, when they are so committed to kosher law, and now all of a sudden they're hearing the Messiah come along and say, hey, it just doesn't matter what you eat. In fact, Paul wrote in Romans chapter 14 these words, all foods are acceptable. Now, Romans chapter 14 is a great chapter. I want to encourage you to go back and read I was going to read it for us, but for sake of time, I'm going to have you go do your homework, read chapter 14. So watch out for legalism, what you can and cannot eat. Again, Romans 14, Leviticus chapter 11 gives you some context. Bottom line, if I could say it this way from Romans 14, you don't want to become a stumbling block for somebody else on what you eat and what you drink or in excess of what you eat or drink or don't eat or drink. So really process Romans chapter 14. But he also talks about here in Colossians, in the first two verses, days, specific days. He mentions them as festivals or new moons. He talks about uh, monthly celebrations and Sabbaths. Now, again, nowhere in the New Testament are Christians even required to keep a Sabbath, recommended to us. A Sabbath is good. Our body needs the rest. But when he's talking about specifically the Sabbath and in terms of the Mosaic Covenant that was established between God and Israel of making sure you set aside that one day for worship, which would be uh, setting aside Friday at sundown till Saturday at sundown. That would have been the traditional Sabbath taken by the Jewish people, which is simply an Old Testament covenant that had been established between God and his people. Now, New Testament believers are not required to keep this Sabbath any more than we're required to keep Yom Kippur or uh, Shabbat or the sabbatic year. Um, so 
those Old Testament regulations can trip us up and cause us to think, oh, well, I've got to keep this because it was written in the Old Testament. If they kept it, we should keep it. Now, a couple of things I just want to mention here. One, we're no longer under the Old Covenant. We're under a new covenant. Jesus establishes a new covenant, and God specifically said that keeping of the Sabbath day was for the Jewish nation, and that was a good thing. But in the New Testament, we're not told that we have to adhere to this particular commandment. And secondly, we know that the early church fathers that began to establish, uh, we know that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, and Jesus rose on the first day of the week. The early Christian church fathers really believed firmly that they should hold sacred the first day of the week as the resurrection day. And so we literally saw a shift from Judaism to Christianity to the church age where they began to worship on the first day of the week to commemorate the resurrection. Romans 14, 5 says, Some think one day is more holy than another day, while others think that every day is alike. You should each... Be fully convinced that whichever day you choose is acceptable. Talking about worship. So after Jesus is resurrected, Sunday became the sacred day where they called it the Lord's Day. In remembrance of His resurrection, you can find that in Acts 20, verse number 7. You can find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse number 2. So from that time on, they observed the first day of the week as their Sabbath day, their day to set aside work and hone in, focus in as a day of worship together. But I want to encourage you, be careful pushing one specific day on somebody as, well, you have to do this day or you have to do this day. I really like Paul's approach here. I do believe Sunday is the traditional day that we should gather, remember the Lord's resurrection, and it's a great day for us to come together and observe the Lord's table But also, I'm a firm believer that we should be worshiping not only on Sunday, we should worship on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And so worship really is captured by the heart of the individual, staying in a posture of worship, and then coming together collectively, we find in the New Testament, as the first day of the week approaches, come together as the body of Christ and worship together. And I'm going to tell you, if you're not used to a gathering together of the saints, You're missing out. As part of the body, you need that. That is healthy for you. You want that. And so I love gathering together with the fellowship family. I love gathering together with you. I'd like to see you personally. I'd like to be able to look into your eyes, but we'll take this for now in trust and hope that maybe we can also have you in the room one day. I do like Paul, him saying, one man esteems all the days alike. I just believe that we should be worshiping every day But collectively, I believe the tradition of Sunday is the New Testament model, and I think that's the right model. Now, verse 17 says, and he's referencing all these, um, the diets and the days, and he says, these are shadows, interesting term here, these are shadows of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Now, notice the difference here between substance and and shadows. A shadow has no reality. Think of it this way. Would you, if you're a guy and you're married to your woman, your girl, would you hug her shadow? No, that's ridiculous because you've got the reality of her. If you've got a pet, would you hug the shadow of your pet? No, you're going to hug the pet. Are you going to Are you going to embrace the shadow of your Five Guys cheeseburger? Or are you going to have the reality of that Five Guys cheeseburger? Now, it'd probably be healthier if you did avoid it, but we're going to indulge not in the shadow, but in the reality of what it is. So why, Paul is saying, why do you settle for the shadow? In other words, let me put it into kind of summarize what he's saying. Legalism is like living in shadow land. Uh, You could be unsaved and check all the religious boxes. And by the way, when I was thinking and processing this, I thought, you know, this is kind of how I was. I grew up in a great Christian home. I could check the boxes. Man, I went to church. I hung out with a Christian family. We prayed over every meal. I went to youth group. I participated in youth activities and camps. I was an Awana kid, if you're familiar with that. I grew up going to Awanas. In other words, 
I checked all the boxes of religion, but I was not a believer until I became a senior in high school at 17 years of age. So can I just say, again, for sake of time, I've given you lots of passages to go back and do your homework. Watch out for legalism. Then Paul gives a second warning, and it's to watch out for mysticism. Uh, mysticism it is essentially uh, the desire or the pursuit, if you will, of a deeper spiritual experience. And let me just say, I think all of us want to go deeper in our walk with Christ, so I want to be careful on the words I choose here and the language so that you hear me correctly. There's nothing wrong with wanting to go deeper, per se, in your walk with Christ. Now, I'm in favor of it. I pray that you are in favor of it. All of us want that. But some go to that extreme, and they don't just go deeper. They go off the deep end in terms of their uh, religious experience. And this is where it becomes very dangerous. Verse 18, Paul said this, Puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind and not holding fast to the head. Notice head is capitalized. That's a reference to what we talked about a few weeks ago. Jesus is the head of the church. So what you do is you get puffed up by the reasons that you create, the experiences that you have, the feelings that you have, and you just start making stuff up. It's not God's rules. It becomes kind of man's rules, and we just start making this stuff up. And here's the problem with mysticism, unlike legalism. Uh, it looks for truth in external things, uh, legalism does, and, but mysticism is different. It looks for the truth in internal things like sensations rather than revelation or feelings and intuition, moods and perceptions, which are all subjective. Those things can change, friend, from moment to moment based on circumstances, based on weather patterns, based on economy. Uh, those things can all change. And what Paul is saying here is this becomes very dangerous because it's less about how you feel and more about how you're grounded in Christ. And so he says this is very dangerous at every single level. By the way, can I just add, can I, can I park here for a moment? I think this has become dangerous in our society because especially in Western culture, in our society today, um, we've even seen this infiltrate in gender identity because now it's not about biology, it's not about reality, it's not about the way God made you in His image. Now it's about identity, it's about how I feel. And so everybody starts to pretend that they're feeling something different. Well, I feel like a cat, I must be a cat. That's not reality. And that's really what Paul is talking about here today. And there's even some today that are denying the reality of how God made them, their human biology. And Paul's saying, this is a concern. And I think it's a concern in our society when a boy says, you know, I feel like a girl. Well, you may feel like a girl, but you're a boy. That's the reality of it. So we're seeing this infiltrate, and people are denying reality. I mean, people are getting wacky on this issue. They're going crazy on this issue. And so Paul says, that's my concern with mysticism. You have to hold tight to the head of the church, and that is Jesus Christ, and be grounded and firm in your foundation to the source of truth. Otherwise, you start going wacky. And you start saying things and pretending things that just are not reality. In fact, there's religions today that believe in order to get to Jesus, you have to go through His mother Mary. So you pray to Mary in order to get to Jesus, and then through Jesus, hopefully to get to God. And so that's a wacky system. That's not at all what the New Testament teaches. When Jesus died on the cross, we now have full access through the blood of Jesus Christ to the throne room of God. So watch out for legalism, watch out for mysticism, and then he gives a third warning, and it's called asceticism. And this is essentially the neglect of the body, if you will. It's like a rigorous denial or self-denial in order to demonstrate your righteousness. So let me just kind of summarize these three, and then let's talk about asceticism. 
So legalism is all about what you do. Mysticism is all about how you feel. And asceticism is all about what you don't do. It's what you don't permit yourself to have. And and it's sad to say that this has been going on through church history for the last couple thousand years. There have been different periods where people that were believed to have been Christians made decisions to reject anything that was good, anything that was beautiful, anything that was comfortable by saying, I'm going to reject those things because I am in pursuit of God. In other words, if I want to follow God, I have to hurt. I need to reject things like marriage. I need to live single. Or I need to reject things like parenthood. Or I need to reject sex in order to be right with God. And they look for the material comforts of life as something that's sinful, something that's wrong, something that hurts their relationship. There's even groups of people religiously that say, I'm going to choose to live my life in poverty because that's going to draw me closer to God. And it's the basic belief that the material world, including our physical body, is nothing more than just evil and unrestrained. Now, uh, there is a side of that that I somewhat agree with. I do believe that our heart is full of things that are not good. That's what the scriptures teach. But through Jesus, through the blood of Christ, when we are attached to the vine, Jesus, when we are growing and the head of the church is Jesus and we're being founded in him, he brings the good and helpful things to our life. So, yes, we can say that, well, my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. We agree with that. And we should do what we can to maintain the body in a proper way. But Paul says, I discipline my body and I do keep it under control. But asceticism is different. Asceticism is saying that I'm going to sanctify my body or my soul through the discipline of my body. I'm going to harm myself. I'm going to make myself feel bad. Uh, in order to gain God's favor, I'm going to do things in a harsh way to my body. He said in verse 21, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to the things that perish as they were used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, and they are of no value to stopping the indulgence of the flesh. In other words, Look how miserable I am. Uh, Look how bad I have it. I must be godly. I'm getting closer to God because I've got it so bad. I look so bad. I'm doing, um, I am subjecting myself to the harmful things and hurting my body. Oftentimes, some religions would say even to the point of severe harming, whipping your body, causing your body to bleed, etc. But These are just nothing more than external rules created by man, external restraints placed on somebody to try to create an internal feeling of righteousness. And so you know what asceticism is. It really boils down to pride. I'm going to do the things in a false humility way that are going to draw me closer to God. It's gratifying the flesh. It makes us feel more spiritual. In fact, Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 6. When he was talking about people that did this asceticism, trying to look bad in order to say, hey, I'm more spiritual. Jesus said this, when you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do. For they try to look miserable and disheveled so people will admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth, that is the only reward they're ever going to get. So here's the thing, friend, when you come to Christ, When you put your faith in and uh, you follow Jesus Christ, he puts a new desire in your heart. He changes you from the inside outwardly. And so it's less about the external appearance and the way you go, and it's about an inward change that is brought about by Jesus. In fact, I thought, okay, here's a good way for us to summarize this passage, and I'm going to put these on the screen for you. Religion is man's quest for God, whereas the gospel is God, his quest for seeking the lost, his quest for you. Religion has, or, uh, or has, its ori- uh, has originated here on the earth, whereas the gospel originates in heaven. Religion is the story of what 
sinful man tries to do for a holy God, but the gospel is the story of what a holy God has done for a sinful man. Religion is good views, whereas the gospel is good news. Religion is man-made, the gospel is a gift of God. Jesus did the finished work by leaving heaven and coming here. He never sinned. He was hung on a Roman cross to die, but while on the cross, took our sin on him. Scripture says, nailed it to the cross, our sin. He paid our debt, our sin debt that we could not pay. He did that on the cross. He was buried for three days after he died, but he rose again on the first day of the week. And I can just tell you, friends, we need Jesus. It is Jesus and Jesus alone that can satisfy you. You are fully complete, chapter 2, verse 10, fully complete in Christ. It's not Jesus plus, it's not Jesus and let me hurt my body or stay away from something that's good that God has said is good. It's not something that's just about a feeling, mysticism. It is Jesus and Jesus alone. So, Let's do this. Let's make some application here uh, in our our passage today from verses 16 to 23. Number one, what kind of religious ideas have you held on to that you recognize as, and I'm putting quotes here, Jesus plus something else? So what is it that you have been hanging on to that thinks Jesus plus? Because it is Jesus and Jesus alone that brings salvation. It is Jesus and Jesus alone that you are grounded and founded in. So I want to encourage you, be rooted in Christ. Secondly, how can you remind yourself this week of the gospel? That is that Jesus plus nothing, and then live that out in your life. What is it that you can do this week to remind yourself of this? Because legalism, mysticism, asceticism, will push back against that. It's going gonna, it's gonna to drive you to think, well, i got to do more, i got to feel this certain way, or i gotta, I got to keep my body from something or keep myself from something. Jesus plus nothing is extraordinary. And then thirdly, I want to I challenge you this week. Would you pray for your church? Maybe even pray, let's call it Big C Church. Let's pray for the church, but specifically pray for the fellowship as well. And all those who are new to the faith, that we will grow deeper in truth and knowledge of God, because these things can quickly infiltrate a church and be very harmful to new believers. And so that's why Paul is addressing, we need to get this shored up. Legalism, mysticism, and asceticism will do nothing but harm new believers, and it will hurt the church. And so today, this passage is good for all of us. God's gift is free to you. It is free to all of humanity, but to you specifically, God's gift of grace through the person of Jesus Christ, is available to you. So have you given your life to Jesus? That would be the big question. Have you given your life to Jesus? It's not Jesus and then I got to do this. It's not Jesus and let me withhold this. It's not, oh, I got to have this warm sensation come over my body in order to know. No, it's Jesus and Jesus alone. He converts the heart and soul of a man and then he begins to change you from the inside out. So friend, I pray today, you would say something like this, God, forgive me of my sin. I give you my life today. I repent, I turn from my sin and my past, and I turn to you, believing you are the only way. And I don't have to add to, I don't have to subtract from, but I believe you are the only way. And so today I give you my life. I call on you, Jesus, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I call on you to forgive me of my sin, believing you died on a cross, you were buried for three days, and you rose again. I call on you to be my Lord and Savior. Friend, if that's you today, welcome to the family of God. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. And I'm so glad you were here today. Well, friends, it has been outstanding to have you a part of this today. I want to make this very personal. You're watching right now, wherever you are. Is there anything that you are going, you know what? I've been wrestling with this. I've I want to follow Jesus, but I've been adding to Jesus plus, and then you can name whatever it is. Well, 
I've been there. I, I understand that. And I just want to encourage you today. Jesus is all you need. You are complete in him. What a great passage this has been. Colossians 1 and Colossians 2, go back and read them in their entirety, thinking about what we've talked about over the last several weeks. And I just want you to know personally, thank you for being here. Thank you for being a part of this incredible opportunity to read and study the Word of God today. And I want to encourage you one last time today, go win your day.